everyone. Thanks for joining me today for our fourth episode of Set the Standard Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon, and today I had the pleasure of speaking with John Broadbent about everything smart manufacturing. So for me, John... smart manufacturing is the ability to collect information from our processes and the technology has now merged that we can do that in real time. So it really gives us visibility into what's going on within the four walls of our factory and some organisations are now extending that out to the sort of larger supply chain so they can see upstream and downstream. So my primary role is to get organisations firstly to understand what smart manufacturing is in the context of Industry 4.0. When I started this journey for myself, I found the whole uh, Industry 4 idea very confusing. There were so many sort of variants and people didn't really understand what it really meant. So I actually went and had a look at uh, what was happening on the world stage and found that the best way to do it was to really get a deep understanding of the components of Industry 4.0. These technologies have now allowed us to um, leverage those technologies to the point that we can now get far more information than we could in the past and in more real-time ways. But to do that, we have to close out Industry 3.0. Right. Which is computerization. So if you've got old equipment that you can't get data out of, there's a problem. And if you have equipment that you can get data out of, but it's not networked, so you don't have Wi-Fi, cyber security, networks, Mm -hmm. firewalls, cloud access, that sort of stuff, then that can limit what you can do. If you look at the World Economic Forum's report that was out in 2018, which Mm -hmm. highlighted uh, top 100 countries, we sit something like 68th. Um, And part of the reason is that we're very low on complexity and we're very low on scalability because our primary GDP for manufacturing is digging stuff out of the ground (laughs) and sending it overseas for value add. Yeah, Uh, yeah. So we don't do that much in the in the complex way. You know, we've lost our car industry now. There are pockets. Don't get me wrong. There's some some quite incredible innovations happening in Australia at the moment, but generally the climate hasn't been all that supportive of smart manufacturing in Australia. But it is getting legs at last. And really, we we have to do it to remain both locally and internationally competitive. We have to embrace uh, complexity. Yeah. And we have to embrace the ability to scale. And to scale means we need to respond rapidly to changing market conditions. Um, The lack of awareness. Yeah. uh, Lack of understanding of what is actually required. And primarily, that's at the leadership level. So SMEs, the general issue is it's noise. (laughs) <laughs> okay okay on their radar they're, okay. they're they're the large majority of businesses you know just not struggling but they're certainly busy doing what they do they don't really have a strategic view of what the next three to five years might look like okay i am seeing now some reshoring happening which is really good because so some of the some of the things that i'm seeing at the sme level is apart from the fact that it's it's, it's noise for them they don't yeah. understand that simple things. I'll give you an example. I was at an injection molding, small injection molding business a few years ago, and the guy was using still, you know, clipboards, paper, yep. recording yep. information. And I said yep. to him, look, why don't you simply create a little web server, AWS as a provider, for example, or Microsoft Azure, whatever you want to do, get a programmer in, create a web form, yep. use an iPad, and just start recording that data electronically and storing it off-premise somewhere in the cloud storage. It probably cost a few thousand dollars to build. It probably cost you hundreds of dollars a month to yep. to run, but at least you're now collecting all that data electronically. It's now in a in a data lake rather than a database, which is yep. easier to mine. Mm-hmm. And then sometime in the future, you can then start mining that information with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and looking for for information as to yep. how you made stuff. You know, whether it's traceability, whether it's batch reporting, whatever it is. Yeah. Initially, visibility. Yeah. So we now know that if you watch a company or monitor a company moving along the industry four journey, there are four distinct stages in in, in manufacturing processes. And a simple example is like a check weigher that's weighing a product end of line, Mm -hmm. um, a packet of goods or a jar of goods or a bottle of goods. And it knows what the weight is supposed to be, but those check weighers typically in packaging are sitting there isolated, just islands of information and no one really looks at it. So if we can mine that information, we can see the pack weights, we yep. compare them to standard, which is the understanding piece. We can then show that we're actually producing overweight product and using statistical process control principles, we can show that our average pack weight is moving north towards yep. the upper control limit. We're about to make reject product. So we get then notify an operator 
And the fourth stage is the adaptable stage where the check wire goes, I know I'm about to make out of or measure out of weight product. Yep. I'm going to feed back to the filling operation automatically to get it to adjust its filling so that I don't make out of weight product. Food and beverage. <laughs> yeah. Some of, the, some of the smaller manufacturers are being really innovative because they've seen the benefits. So I've worked on projects where we've integrated what's called the ERP system. So yep. the, the planners produce the schedule. The schedule is released to the factory floor electronically. Yep. The orders appear on control screen in the factory. The operator starts the order at a particular work center or operation. Yep. And all that information moving backwards and forwards between those two worlds is real time. Point of view of communication standards and the, and the types of communication that systems use. There is a bit of a, um, it's almost like the, the Sony VHS beta uh, argument that happened, you know, 30, 40 years ago, I'm showing my age. Um, <laughs> there are standards emerging for integration between factories from ERP to factory floor. Yep. There are standards emerging for the communication standards and there are standards emerging for the way that data is shared because one of the biggest issues is if you go out and buy a system and you put that on your factory floor to do something and then yep. you go out and you buy another system that does another piece of functionality you now have to interface those two systems and there is no standard as such to be able to do that okay if you then put, introduce a third system a, B, and C, C now has to talk to A and B. And then you introduce D, D now has to talk to A, B, and C, and, and it just becomes unbelievably complex. I see at the moment that the world is splitting into two. Okay. If we start at the machine level, there are machine or equipment suppliers who wish to lock down their intellectual property, even though it's your machine. I have a philosophy about that, that if you own the machine and you own the switchboard and you own the controller and you own the code, yep. it's in it. Um, yep. But there are some vendors out there going, no, 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 it's our code and you can't touch it and it's our intellectual property. And there are easy ways to get around that with holding stuff in escrow or even having um, unlimited use agreements that you, you know, it's a license effectively that you can use their code in that controller for that machine and that's it, that's the purpose. Yep. Um, but the bloody minded vendors, I think their days are going to come to an end because there are the enlightened equipment suppliers who are going, we're industry 4.0 ready. We've yep. created a special area in our controller that you can mine. And in yep. there are all the things that we think you should be monitoring, you know, production rates and temperatures and uptime and downtime and all that sort of stuff. So that's the first part where I see it splitting. Yep. I, I then see that then moving up to a level of, of manufacturers themselves where some are going, yes, we absolutely have to embrace industry 4.0. Yep. Um, to do that, we have to get our leadership on board. This can never be a bottom up approach. If we want manufacturers and we want engineers, automation people at the coal face to yep. push up to their board level, mm -hmm. ideas around the industry four projects, IIoT, um, what we call edge enablement, yep. uh, it doesn't work. It has to be top down. The that those organizations recognize that it is a fourth industrial revolution. It, it, it'd be like sitting in the second industrial revolution, which was the advent of electricity around 1870 and going, it's just something newfangled. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stick with steam. Or in 1969, when the third industrial revolution kicked in, which was all about electronics and computers and putting in you know, uh, PLCs, programmable logic controllers and machinery to run machines differently and more flexible with more flexibility, it'd be like saying, I'm not gonna do that, I'm just gonna stick to my old, you know, relay systems and and, and, and dig in and almost entrench yourself to yeah. not move with the times. Hey everyone, I uh, hope you enjoyed that episode. I just wanna thank John again for coming on and give us some, some great insight into smart manufacturing and its importance for the Australian economy. Uh, if you're interested in any other episodes that we have, we have them on our Spotify page on, under Set the Standard and also um, on our YouTube channel. Take care.